Hello and welcome to the Kamla Show. We bring you interviews and conversations with technologists, entrepreneurs, filmmakers and other newsmakers from in and around the San Francisco Bay Area. And my guest today is the CEO of a cheese company, Matthew Said. And you're the CEO of Lyrical Foods or CEO of Kite, uh, Kite Hill? Yes, it's actually the company name is Lyrical Foods. Our branded line of food products is called Kite Hill. So what would be the right way to address you, CEO of Lyrical Foods then? I, I, either is fine. Either is fine. Absolutely. Okay. So we have in front of us, for the first time, I guess, this is cheese not made out of milk. That's exactly right. And, and what I would say is that this is the um, first of its kind line of cheeses that have been made using traditional cheese making technique. And I think it's a really important distinction because what that means is that we basically start with, in this case, nuts. We, f we create a milk, and then at that point, we follow the, the sort of time-honored tradition of cheesemaking, which is we inoculate the milk with cultures and enzymes. That then forms a curd. We cut the curd, drain the whey, and at that point, we have fresh cheese, which we can make, um, or we can, for example, in the, in the case of this, this other cheese, we can, we can put it in an aging room and create a rind on it, much like a, a camembert or a, uh, or a brie. So, um, What's distinct about this cheese is that we make it the exact same way that cheese is made. So you're just swapping out the milk for almond milk That's or some kind of a nut milk. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So we use almond milk, whereas others might use cow's milk, sheep's milk, or goat's milk. Okay. Before we go any further, we need to taste the cheese. I tasted it, <laughs> but I have somebody... I think that's a great idea. <laughs> I tasted it and I was blown away, but we have somebody... Kathleen is going to give us a shot, and she's going to try the cheese and tell us what she thinks of it, and... Uh, and, the, and what is it that she's trying? So this, she's trying the, the, the aged, um, soft, ripened cheese. And what's interesting is that it, this cheese forms this beautiful rind, as I said, much like a camembert or brie. And um, the flavor in this case, as with all of our cheeses, is made through the process. So the taste and texture is a function of our process, as opposed to having to add different ingredients to approximate the taste and texture mm. of cheese. It's mm. a very natural process. So it's this sort of almost um, interesting way in which new, in, new knowledge and new know-how um, allow us to, to actually follow a very time-honored tradition. Mm. It's fascinating. It's delicious. It's really so good. so she gives it like a it. thumbs up because That's... she's a chemist and <laughs> you know, there you go. There she's you go. traveled all over the world and eaten. So th this, this measures up? It's delicious. I've tried many cheeses. This is very, very good. I'm glad you like I'm it. I'm going to grab one on my way out. Okay, so she's <laughs> grabbing a box on her way out. Thanks, so, Kellen. Thank you. So you got a thumbs up from somebody who never tried the cheese. And that was exactly my uh, reaction when I tried it at the Bite uh, Silicon Valley uh, conference. I was blown away, and everybody who was milling around the table, they were coming for second and third helpings. It was, it was really nice to see. And, and, and the other thing that's important to point out is that because we're able to achieve the taste and texture through the process and not through having to add ingredients that approximates the taste and texture of cheese, it actually is cheese, we have a very clean ingredient statement. There's really nothing other than, um, in, the, in, the, in the case of, of most of these cheeses here, you have almond milk enzymes, cultures, and a little bit of salt. And that's exactly what you would find on the back of any other traditionally made cheese. So we have how many cheeses here? Is cheese the right word, plural, cheeses? I think that cheeses is absolutely um, grammatically correct. Okay. Um, so we have a <laughs> soft ripened. Lit, you're a lit major. I was. Yes. <laughs> we have um, a soft ripened cheese. We have two f different soft fresh cheeses. One is a is a plain, um, which is a, is a terrific, um, very versatile cheese. Um, you can put it on uh, sort of a tomatoes, a caprese, caprese salad. You can put it on a sandwich. We have another that's flavored with truffle, dill, truffle oil, dill, and chive. Um, and then the fourth artisanal cheese, which is in that package that you see right there, is a, is a, is a traditional ricotta made from almond milk. Mm -hmm. And that's a very interesting product because it's an ingredient. And so for the first time, we're giving people an ingredient that they can use to, to, to then go home and create with and make any really sort of um, recipe that they want. Which it, calls for ricotta. Exactly. So whether it's lasagna or stuffed shells or putting it on, on pizza, um, even making a ricotta, uh, a ricotta cheesecake. Mm. You can do that with this product. It behaves a lot like traditional um, cow's milk ricotta. Is it a schmear? This, this is a schmear, depending on where you're from. But we have actually two different flavors of schmear. One is a plain, and one is a chive. And this one is, um, is our chive. And uh, this is 
if for somebody who is, as I did, grow, who, who grew up on um, bagels. bagels and cream cheese and has just sort of found over the years that you've stopped eating them, uh, and in my case, largely because I just didn't want to have the, the high fat dairy and, and sort of was a little down on cream cheese, now I've got this fantastic um, nut milk cream cheese and it's got all the beautiful taste and all the texture of cream cheese only it's made from nut milk so as a result it's got all of the the good attributes and none of the the less favorable attributes of high fat dairy. Hmm. So let's go back to the story of how this all started. It started with Chef Tal Ronin who is a well-known chef. That's he right. helped Oprah with her cleansing diet. Yeah so he's so tall is a celebrated chef from Los Angeles who is um, well known for helping uh, a slew of different celebrities, Oprah included, um, really sort of come to appreciate and um, enjoy plant-based uh, plant food. And uh, he had been long trying to, I think, figure out how to incorporate more um, dairy-like, plant-based dairy, into his, into, his, into his own creations as, as a chef. Simultaneously, you had um, a fellow by the name of Dr. Patrick Brown, a Stanford professor in biochemistry, who is a lifelong plant-based eater and was one day, the way that he tells it to me, wishing that he could have some cheese and just wishing that um, he were able to enjoy that. And he said, you know, cheese is, 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 is at its core a biochemical reaction that yeah. happens when you inoculate the milk and that then sort of causes the proteins to bind and, and this biochemical reaction is, is essential in cheese making. And if you can cause a milk to create that curd and go through that reaction, then, then you can make any cheese you want. And he said, well, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty good at what I do. I've been doing this for a lot of years. I, I teach at Stanford and I'm pretty well known in my field. I should be able to figure this out. And so my understanding is he then took some time, dedicated himself to figuring out the essential ingredients necessary to make a milk that did not come from an animal, undergo that biochemical reaction, and form a curd. And mm. that was the first time it had ever been done. So they, they, they both were working independently. That's exactly right. And so, um, but, they, 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 but they had... They you were know, friends. They knew each other. And so at some point, Pat reached out to Tall and said, I have made this discovery. And in essence, taking that core know-how and working with Tall and the third gentleman who came together to form the, the, the sort of threesome that founded this company is a chef, and at the time he was teaching cheese making at Cordon Bleu in Boston, a fellow by the name of Monte Casino. And Tall, interestingly, went to go speak at Cordon Bleu, and he sat in on Monte's class. And it was funny because apparently at the time Monte was teaching uh, traditional cheese making and charcuterie. And Tall sat in on the class and said, you know, you're wonderful uh, at, at what you do. Um, I am trying to make plant-based cheese. And they together then, they, they together then um, uh, partnered up with Pat, who had this technology, and Monte, the cheese-making expertise, and, and, and Tall, this sort of real understanding of plant-based food, and they then formed what is now uh, the, the, the nucleus that, that created lyrical foods Lyr and these initial cheeses that, that you see in front of you. How, uh, how, how long ago did you introduce this? This was actually just introduced nationally about nine months ago in the fall of 2014. We just shipped it for the first time nationally. And then they did something very interesting. You tied up with the lady who buys cheese for Whole Foods and so you have you That's sell exactly them only right. through Whole Foods. That's exactly right. So Kathy Strange, who is the global cheese buyer at Whole Foods, at some point was introduced to Tall, and she learned about what they were doing. And Whole Foods is a company which is passionately committed to helping people um, eat healthier food uh, and more sustainable food through their stores. Found out about uh, this product line and said, "This is very game changing. We've never seen anything like this in cheese." And they basically decided that they would commit to carrying all of the products from Kite Hill nationally. And so today, 
all of these products are distributed nationally in Whole Foods. Mm. But okay. before uh, uh, Chef Ronan uh, met uh, Professor Brown, who I believe at Stanford, he's the one who I think expressed all the genes. Uh, he's the guy behind. That's right. He made some fairly substantial um, contributions to to to, to science um, that had to do with how you analyze and process um, genes. DNA. Yeah, That's DNA. exactly right. And he made uh, apparently a, a discovery. Uh, that is now being used in, you know, literally worldwide in how um, uh, DNA is is analyzed. Mm. And it, yes. So, but Chef Ronan was in his quest to make this uh, alternate cheese, That's exactly which, right. which is not uh, non-dairy based. Apparently, he was invited to the Wynn Hotel in Las Vegas and supposedly <laughs> yeah. served yeah. some kind of a cheese That's that didn't exactly go down right. very well. Yeah, so basically, um, amongst his many, um, the many hats that Tall wears, one of them is he's a, a consulting chef to, to Steve Wynn and all of his properties. And periodically sits down, in this case, with all of the executive chefs from the many, many restaurants throughout the Wynn properties in Las Vegas. And on one occasion, he went in front of them and he served them a cheese. And apparently, one of the very well-known chefs, in, in essence, spit it out and said, this is not going to be served in my restaurant. And it was sort of that event that caused Tall to say, we need to do better. And, um, and I think that was sort of his personal motivation to, to ultimately help create these cheeses in front of you. And you've raised money from Kosla Ventures. Yeah, you know, when you are trying to do something that is new to the world and really pioneer new territory, you have to basically find the resources that allow you to invest in new technology, in new processes, and ultimately when it comes to consumer goods and pioneering the marketplace. And so um, initially Pat and Tall um, found a very, very welcome partner in uh, Coastal Ventures. Apparently Vinod was very interested in what they were doing, not just in... Um, pioneering completely new technology in developing dairy, but also Pat simultaneously is working on a plant-based meat product. And it was that joint vision that um, Coastal Ventures decided to invest behind. And as a result, they really did help, I think, catapult the company um, into a point where it was able to basically uh, afford to develop its own manufacturing facility and really accelerate its path to, the, path to market. So how much uh, did you raise from Coastal? Several million. Several million. Yes. Is it just one round? Uh, we've had two rounds of two formal rounds of investment at this point. I went looking to see how much money, but mm -hmm. there's no disclosure. Is that something that you haven't disclosed? How much you have? Uh... I, I'm going to tell you that I think it's probably out there if you wanted to really look for it. But um, no, I'm guessing it's not something that we publicly announce at this point. Okay. But we've gone through a couple rounds of financing. We are um, always actively looking for additional financing, and that's largely because we are undergoing fairly aggressive growth right now. Um, and any time you grow a new company, quite frankly, you want to have the resources in place so that you can handle all of the, the, the constraints that happen around uh, or requirements around funding the additional growth of the business, whether it's distribution, whether it's inventory, um, developing new products. We are just at the real sort of cusp of everything that we can do around developing new products with the know-how we have and the tremendous um, you know, IP and understanding of how to make so there is a IP... Uh... Absolutely. We have a, we have a patented process um, for how we do what we do, and it's been patented on... Um, you know, in every major market in the world, basically. And so with that IP and with the understanding, and, and to be fair, it's not just about a, a patent. There's been a tremendous amount of energy spent in creating the manufacturing processes and know-how, because at its, at its heart, cheese is not, a, is not just uh, a science. You can't follow a formula and produce cheese at the end of the day, particularly not artisanal cheese. There's a tremendous amount of know-how. It's as much an art form, and so we have people that day in and day out, manage our production, much like they do any other artisanal product. They go in, they look at the cheese, they, they, they determine, is it ready to be flipped? Is it the right moisture? Is it the right humidity? Is it the rind developed enough? And so it's this very careful balance between the science that we bring to it and the know-how that we've acquired over, over a couple of years of making these products. And so you could look at, um, uh, at, the, at the actual formulations, but that would never, never really allow you to make what we make.
Traditionally, in the Bay Area, we associate the North Bay, Pataluma area, with cheese. Uh, that's where all the artisanal cheese makers are. You don't associate Hayward in the East Bay right. with uh, cheese. Um, what prompted you to move from Menlo Park to Hayward? We were building our own manufacturing facility, and quite frankly, um, Hayward is a terrific, very business-friendly and manufacturing-friendly city. And so um, what I would say is that it's inc it would be incredibly cost-prohibitive to build a manufacturing facility for what we do in, in Menlo Park. Mm. Um, I also, to be fair, should tell you I wasn't the CEO of the company at the time that that right. decision was made. But I will also tell you that Hayward today has over 100 food manufacturers in it. And I know that only because I was recently contacted by the city of Hayward to come and meet with us. And it was a comment that they made. And I was also very surprised. I know that there's a fair number of food companies there. I would not have guessed there were, that there were that many. 100. 100 food companies in the city of Hayward, which is, that is, is really amazing. surprising. Yeah. Uh, how surprised are you? You've been in the food industry for many years, I, I'm guessing 20 years Almost at least. Almost 20 years, that's correct. Uh, how surprised are you with what is happening at the intersection of food and technology in the Bay Area? Millions of dollars have been pumped. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that's it's right. more than at least that's right. close to half I a like billion. To I like to kiddingly say that the two big investment sectors today are big data and food. Um, and, and then and the, if the two marry, big data and food? At some point, it very, will, it very possibly will. In fact, there are a few companies that are marrying the two. But um, you're absolutely right. I came out to the Bay Area and worked in a traditional consumer packaged goods company helping manage large multinational food brands. And it was a great role. It was exactly what I wanted to do, a great way to cut your teeth. But for those of us who lived through the first bubble, it was interesting. Web and Webvan, I know a lot of people who left to go to Webvan. Um, it was interesting to sit on the sidelines and say, boy, look at what's happening outside our doors. This is just this sort of hotbed of, of, of sort of internet and technology um, growth and innovation. And we're sort of on the sidelines in this fairly staid industry where nothing really seems to change very much year to year. Fast forward 20 years and we are in arguably one of the most transformative periods for food, period, whether that's food from a life sciences standpoint, much like what we do here, which is bring life sciences to try to create new and better, more sustainable foods for a growing global population, or food from a distribution standpoint, intermediating distributors trying to solve the last mile of distribution for consumers or businesses, um, or, or, or everything in between. And so food, I think what's determined, uh, what's happened is a lot of people a lot of businesses, and invariably the, the venture community have have identified food as an incredibly large industry globally that has undergone very little change, and so it's incredibly ripe for the proverbial disruption that is, um, you know, that is happening now. And so it'll be very interesting to see over time um, both sort of in the invariable shakeout that's going to happen, how many of these companies are actually going to survive, and two, what the industry looks like when the dust settles. So that'll be very exciting. How surprised are you with this notion of chefs and their labs? You know, it started off with that chef, I think, Nopa in, uh, mm -hmm. in, 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 is it in Norway or Sweden? You know, one of the Scandinavian countries. Yes. And then Netflix has this whole series at the chef's table and they have a lot of chef-related programs. There's Anthony Baudin with his show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Suddenly food has become very sexy and there's a lot of money in it. Yes, chefs as rock stars. That's exactly right. I would actually tell you that it's we've sort of e we've sort of evolved beyond chefs as rock stars, and now we're at a point where it's farmers as rock stars, and I think that's just a reflection of the in cultural importance that's now sort of been that that's been ordained to um, originally chefs and the people that create our food, and now as as we're starting to see consumers become much more sophisticated and and wanting more information uh, about where that food comes from, not just who prepared it. You're starting to see the real value placed on the people that grow, and rightfully, the value placed on the people that grow our food and raise um, the food that is consumed by people. And so we're very much, as a society, finally giving due credit to the people who, who really feed us. So that brings me to a question, because you said the farmers, mm -hmm. and farmers that grow almonds in a state like California where we yep. have drought. Absolutely. How do you handle the fact that you're making cheese from almond, which requires a lot of water? 
to grow. Yeah, yeah, so you're exactly right. There Amins must be a lot of criticism leveled against you. That's exactly right. And to be fair, almonds have, be have been fairly demonized in the media lately. And I think that um, there's been two types of stories that have taken place. There was an original wave of story um, that took place where you had almonds being singled out as, as the, the culprit in this drought. And then you had a second wave of um, media coverage that actually sought to correct that misconception. Um, and, and, and organizations like the New York Times and Bloomberg published articles saying, no, 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 no. The, the problem here is not, is not almonds. Um, and, and, and I will back that up. The reality is that the single largest water consuming crop in the state of California today is alfalfa. It's oh, not really? almonds, and it's alfalfa that the is sprouts. used. Uh, no, actually, the feed oh, alfalfa. Okay. It's a feed as a as a feed stock, okay. a crop that is used to feed cows. And if you think about it, California is not a big meat producing state, so mm. this alfalfa does not go to feed cattle that are being used for meat production. It's going to feed cows that are used for milk production in the dairy industry. So. Alfalfa, the feed that's used to sustain cows, consumes the most water of any crop in the state of California, period, full stop. Then, after you've fed the cow, you need to water the cow on a daily basis because, understandably, cows are thirsty. And finally, it takes water to process the milk. And so at the end of the day, we can talk about how much water almonds use, or we can talk about the difference in the, in the full, both direct and indirect costs of a plant-based diet versus an animal-based diet. And I think that any study, period, would tell you that this, the, 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 the amount of um, greenhouse gas emissions from a plant-based diet are multiples less than anything that, that, that would come from eating an animal-based diet. Plus, um, cows pollute the water, a big issue that we have. Greenhouse gases from the industrial livestock sector are the number one contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. They take up a massive amount of land, period. And almond trees finally sequester carbon. So mm. it's, it's really fairly black and white. But unfortunately, this is um, largely a situation where you had the media blowing this largely out of proportion. I don't think anyone would deny almonds are a, are a thirsty crop, mm. absolutely. But if the question is, should I eat cheese or dairy from cow's milk versus cheese or dairy from almond milk, you are doing a much, much better service to the environment by having an almond milk-based product. Mm. Um, and the other thing I would add is that today we use almond milk and we are always continuously striving to innovate and come up with new other. ways to use other nuts that are less water intensive, mm. as well as potentially other plant stocks that would allow us to create a broad line of dairy that's perhaps from something other than nuts. Mm. So uh, what about cheese made from cashew nut milk or other milk? Uh, do you make anything out of cashew nut milk? Not Have you today. You don't? No. Because there's a company, I think Miyako, up, I think. Yep, Miyoko's, that's exactly Miyoko's. right. Yeah. They make out of uh, cashew nut. Yeah, and again, sort of going back to the original discussion about how we think of cheese as this fairly time-honored technique where you take milk and you inoculate it and it creates a curd, that's very different than the way any other company. So cashew period. nut milk doesn't make... You no, become... it's less about milk and more about there's a lot of companies that take nuts and, and grind the nuts and then form a paste and then shape it into a cheese, oh, okay. which is very different than taking um, a milk, milk and then inoculating it and following a traditional cheese making process. So where our, again, our flavor and our texture comes from the cheese making process, the mass comes from the formation of proteins coming together. It's very different than taking nut paste and, and putting it in a mold that shapes it into something that looks like a cheese. Mm. So now your cheese is... They're both perfectly fine. I just would tell you that they're fundamentally very different products. The taste, the taste is very different. The texture, the process, yeah. exactly. And this is now available all over America? These are distributed nationally in Whole Foods. And, and, and just going back to the distinction, I would tell you that if you make cheese, the way the cheese is made, you can do things like form a rind. Mm. If you're shaping something into the shape of a cheese, it would be very hard to create a rind on that product. Mm. So there's a rind on this. Yeah. What is in store for your company for the next two to three years? Great question. So as I said, while we started with cheese, we've evolved from cheese. And the vision is to create a very broad line 
of the very best tasting plant-based dairy products. So while it's easy to say we want to make dairy and we want to make a broad line and we want it to be absolutely great tasting, it's much more difficult to do in practice than it is to simply say. And while there's a lot of non-dairy, you know, dairy alternative products out there today, I think a lot of people would tell you that they, that there's, there's a lot of misgivings about them. They don't perhaps have as great a taste profile as, as you would want. And, and food at the end of the day should taste good. And if it doesn't taste good, I would argue, well, then you shouldn't be forced to eat it. You shouldn't have to eat it. Mm. But today there's not a lot out on the market that's particularly good. Are and you so, making yogurt? Are you making yogurt? I'm not going to say whether we're making yogurt, but what I will tell you is that we are evolving beyond cheese. We also have the cream cheese. And we actually also have coming out in the next eight weeks a line of ravioli. So we're moving into entrees. And if you imagine what one can do with ricotta, then you can see how we could uh, we could take that and really create the first line of really great tasting entrees, as well as a, as, as other dairy products, which I'll, I'll remain nameless at the moment. But you can just use your imagination. There's a lot of opportunity if you just walk into your store and say, wouldn't it be nice if that tasted good and were made out of something other than cow's milk? And that's exactly what we're trying to accomplish. My last question is, Kite Hill is named after a place in Stanford? Yes. I actually didn't know that until somebody said to me, you know, this is a, a place. I don't believe it's on Stanford's campus, but it's, I think, on or adjoining it. And it Where turns out... Where the professors out, live, I think. My understanding is it's in, in, in Pat Brown's backyard. You'll find, <laughs> you will find the original Kite Hill. <laughs> Matthew, thank you so much for stopping by and talking about this alternative to dairy cheese. And we wish you all the best with Kite Hill. Thanks so much for having me. And thank you for tuning in. If you missed any of our programs, you can watch them online on our YouTube channel. We'll be back again with another episode. Until then, goodbye. And thank you for tuning in. I almost forgot to say thank you. <laughs>